Since you clicked on this video, then there's a good chance you're already well aware. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is one of the most broken games ever made. Not because it's poorly made, on the contrary. To this day, Ocarina is the only video game to have ever reached a Metacritic rating of 99%. But how could the most broken game also be the best? If you learn anything from my channel, let it be this. All games have glitches, and it's not a lack of quality assurance that brings them to the surface, it's the size of the player base. Ocarina of Time has the misfortune of being so universally appealing, and for so long, that its every last string of code has been micro-analyzed down to the binary level. That's not an exaggeration, by the way. Ocarina of Time now has not one, but two different native PC ports made entirely without the involvement of Nintendo. So to say that we know a little bit about how this game works might be a bit of an understatement. Get comfy. It's time to break the legend itself, Ocarina of Time. This video is sponsored by the minimalist video game inspired streetwear clothing brand, Project Orochi. Orochi makes t-shirts, hoodies, shorts, socks, you name it, all with original artwork inspired by video game franchises, many of which I featured in the Glitch series on this channel. Dark Souls, Elden Ring, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Metroid to name a few, but I've also been told that they are currently developing a Zelda inspired collection as well, which could be dropping any day now. They call their stylistic approach Noticeable Absence, and coming from a fellow minimalist, I really like what they're going for here. If you're like me and enjoy repping your favorite franchises while out and about, but aren't into that traditionally cringy, gamery aesthetic, Project Orochi might have what you're looking for, creating a striking balance that combines elegant style with fantastic reference material that subtly says, yeah, I have better taste than you actually. Check them out at projectorochi.com or by clicking the link in the video description. And thanks again to Project Orochi for sponsoring this video. Before we get started, I need to state the obvious that no, we aren't going to talk about every single OOT glitch ever discovered in this one video. ZFG covered almost all of them during Games Done Quick 2021, and it took him nearly 5 hours. Instead, my goal is to create a playthrough of beginner-friendly exploits with powerful results that you can follow along with on any port of the game, and learn more about it in the process. The 3DS version is kind of its own beast, so your mileage may vary there. I'm also banning extremely game-breaking exploits like Ace, SRM, and Wrong Warping, so that I'm forced to play through more of the game and get more creative. Trust me, this playthrough is going to be wild enough already. From a new game, things start off fairly normal. We leave Link's house, grab the Kokiri Sword from the Boulder Maze, and buy the Deku Shield from the shop. With these equipped, we are supposed to enter the Great Deku Tree, the game's first dungeon, and once it's finished, this stupid kid will stop blocking our path out of the forest. Of course, we could also cheat and clip straight through him. To pull this off, I need to teach you what is perhaps the simplest glitch in all of Ocarina. When Link swings his sword in Ocarina of Time, a white trail follows behind the swing, which designates the slash's collision. At the beginning of the swing animation, the game enables the trail, and at the end of the animation, it disables it. So what would happen if we were to interrupt the swing animation halfway through so that it never got to disable the trail like it's supposed to? By holding R to block with your shield, and then pressing B, Link will perform a crouch stab. This attack is no different than a slash, except that during a crouch stab there is a single frame during which you can interrupt the animation with a different action and keep the sword trail active forever. This is called the Infinite Sword Glitch, or ISG for short. Talking to an NPC, reading a sign, picking up an object Link can carry, even Navi can all trigger ISG, and although this trick is frame perfect, Ocarina of Time only runs natively at 20 FPS meaning your one frame window is three times larger in this game than it would be in a modern game running at 60. In fact, getting ISG is so easy, I'd argue that if you know absolutely nothing about this glitch until watching this video, you could pick it up in about 15 minutes. ISG has several unusual properties that we'll get into a bit later, such as preventing Link from walking off the edges of platforms, but for now, all you really need to know is that it utterly wrecks this stupid kid. By facing this wall at a slight angle, Link can crouch stab the wall to get knocked backward by the ricochet, pushing A at the same time to get stuck inside of the kid's model. When the talking animation ends, he will be broken free from his original path, now orbiting around Link instead. Although we are now trapped within this much smaller circle, by luring the kid up on the upper ramp of the right side of the log, it's possible to roll underneath him to escape the forest, skipping the Deku Tree. This triggers the cutscene with Saria as normal, where you'll get the Fairy Ocarina, an item we could have technically skipped with a different glitch, but hey, 
Now we have it for convenience. Now that we've made it to Hyrule Field, we meet this owl who talks for a long time, and once he finally leaves, we will have unrestricted access to most of the game. By heading to Kakariko Village immediately and reaching the bottom of the well early before we're supposed to, we can collect bomb chews, which, unlike bombs, do not require the bomb bag, allowing us to break this game's intended order severely. First, we go to the right of Hyrule Field and use the stairs, or, okay, I guess we talk to the owl again. He's telling us once again to go meet Zelda in Hyrule Castle, which is normally the first thing you do after leaving the forest, and we will do that eventually, but like I said, we're going to Kakariko first, so chill out. Now that we're here, we can talk to the Kako Lady and find all of her missing chickens for a free empty bottle, one of the most broken items in Ocarina of Time, and a required item for this run. Normally, the Kakariko Well is full of water and can't be drained until Link learns the Song of Storms as an adult, but of course, this too can be skipped. We don't actually need to drain the water so much as we need Link to stop floating at the top of it, and this can be accomplished with a glitch called a Navi Dive. By climbing out of the well and standing on the very edge, Link will fall if you press B to draw your sword. During that window, you can press B again to perform a mid-air jump slash, and during that window, if you press C up to talk to Navi, the text box will appear while Link is falling. Since normally entering water mid-conversation should be impossible, the game doesn't bother to check for it, and Link instantly sinks all the way to the bottom. Once the text box is closed, the water will behave as normal again, and we have to quickly swim through the entrance to the dungeon before Link floats back up to the top. If Navi isn't pestering you currently and you don't want to wait for the prompt to appear on C up, you can also do the same thing with a cucko. As a callback to A Link to the Past, if you hit a cucko enough times, a cutscene will play where a flock of them begin attacking Link until you either die or leave the area. We can abuse this cutscene in the same way we abuse Navi's text prompt to sink to the bottom of the water. First, pick up a cucko and throw it on the ground so that it begins hopping in place. Then quickly hold R and press B to crouch stab, pressing A to pick up the cucko to get ISG at the same time. Since the game thinks that Link's sword is always being swung while ISG is active, the cucko is taking damage every frame Link holds it, meaning the cutscene will trigger the moment the cucko hits the ground. Now that we've primed the cutscene, take the cucko to the edge of the well, Press R to raise Link's shield, dropping the cucko, and backflip before it hits the ground. This will allow Link to continue falling through the water as the cutscene plays, and same as before. Once the cutscene ends, Link will begin floating back up, giving us just enough time to swim to the dungeon's entrance. Regardless of your preferred method, the result is the same. We're in the bottom of the well, early. God help us, have you seen the things in this place? Immediately inside is a pot with Deku sticks, and a bit further in are pots and or chests with Deku nuts, both of which you should grab, but again, we're here for choose. Ultimately, the path we need to take is through the crawl space underwater at the very entrance of the first room. Normally, you're supposed to go to the opposite side of the well and play Zelda's lullaby to drain the water. We have the ocarina, but we don't have lullaby, so if we try to play the song, nothing happens. Okay, well, what about another Navi dive to sink to the bottom? Because we begin floating back up the moment the glitch ends, Link wouldn't have enough time to crawl through the hole. Any other room transition, and we might have been able to surpass it this way, but because it's specifically a crawl space we have to use, we're going to need a more serious glitch. Luckily for us, I have just that. First, grab a small key from one of the two chests hidden behind illusory walls in the corners of the square waterway, then make your way to the northeastern corner with this crawl space. Once you make it to the other side, you'll find a small room with a locked door on the left wall. Make sure you save your game here, because if you unlock this door and don't trigger the glitch, you'll need to reset in order to try again. What we have to do is pass through the crawl space, then quickly roll down left and press A to unlock the door before the camera is released and begins following Link again. Press A too early, and this will happen, where Link hasn't made it fully to the door. Press A too late, and this will happen, where the camera is freed from the crawl space properly and has time to transition to the door being unlocked. But press A at the perfect time, and this will happen. The game thinks Link has unlocked the door and passed into the next room. But when the camera returns to our control, we see that we haven't left the room with the crawl space. When a new room loads in Ocarina, the game unloads some larger actors from the previous room to save memory and improve performance. One of these actors the game unloads in this scenario is the water from the main room of Bottom of the Well. But if you recall, we never actually passed into the next room like the game thinks we did. This means if we go back through the crawl space at this point and back into the main room of the well, Link will no longer have splashing animation while walking through the water. And if we jump down into the flooded pit with the crawl space at the entrance, he sinks straight down to the bottom because the water isn't loaded in in the first place. No need to rush. This glitch will remain active until we open a door and reload the room properly. So take your time, cheater. The opposite side of this crawl space holds a room with a giant Skulltula and leads to the dead hand mini boss. 
trigger the fight and defeat the dead hand in order to spawn a chest with the lens of truth, which is a completely useless item for us. No, literally we have zero use for this item. We came here not for the boss reward, but to pass back through the door and reload the water properly from the actor glitch in order to set up our next step. And before we go any further, I need to take a moment to teach you a technique that I didn't know was possible in Ocarina before making this video. As you probably already know, while climbing on an object you can press A to have Link let go and drop to the ground. It's meant to be impossible to re-grab the object after A is pressed until Link touches the ground, but a precise string of inputs will allow us to do just that. First, hold the analog stick straight down just as you press A to let go and allow Link to fall for at least one frame, then quickly snap the analog stick back straight up on the very next frame and hold it there. If you issue these inputs quickly enough, it's possible to release and re-grab what Link is climbing on at your will. Which by the way, I highly suggest practicing by itself before trying the next glitch. You'll notice that when Link re-grabs the fence this way, he clips partially deeper into it for a few frames before being ejected back out. This is what we're planning to exploit. First reset the room by passing through the door to the mini boss room and then back through again. This respawns the giant Skultula. Now stand back to back with it and throw a Deku Nut to stun it. Now quickly back walk off the ledge to begin climbing. Move Link three times to the left, down once. At this point you should let go of the fence and re-grab it using the technique from before. Just as Link grabs the fence again and clips inside a bit, the Skultula will attack, pushing Link the rest of the way through the wall and out of bounds falling completely to the unloaded basement of the well. This is known as a vine clip, but can be done on any climbable object, not just vines. The important part is you need a way to take damage while Link is partially within a wall from re-grabbing it in order to clip through and to the other side. We are now in the basement, while the upper floor of the well remains loaded. The water that makes up the flooded waterway above us extends down infinitely, meaning Link will begin floating up whenever we are directly underneath water. Our goal is to reach the chest in the small room just here, and though it's a bit finicky, we can use the water that remains loaded from the room above to float up and do just that. This chest holds the bomb chews we came here for, which once again do not require the bomb bag to use. From here we can clip out of this room to pop through the debris that we were supposed to clear with a bomb to reach this chest the intended way, and leave the well completely, floating back up through the water and returning to Kakariko. So what is the first thing we're going to do with these powerful tools that we've smuggled from late game to early game? We're going to Hyrule Castle to meet Zelda. Yeah, unfortunately this isn't a step we can put off for very long, as the cutscene that triggers upon meeting Zelda sets a story progression flag that we need for later glitches to work. Leave Kakariko and... Yes, Owl, thank you. I know. Go meet Zelda. This is the third time you've told me. Just because we have to go to Hyrule Castle now doesn't mean that we have to do it the intended way. So run straight past Malin, skipping the weird egg, and oh my god, you have got to be kidding me. Climb the vines to the right and jump down to the path below to be confronted by the guards we're supposed to avoid in order to make it into the castle. Rather than avoiding their line of sight all along the way, you can instead simply align the camera up precisely with the angle at which these two walls meet, and hold up to walk straight up the seam like a ramp until reaching the top of the wall we were never meant to stand on. This glitch is only a minor advantage here, but it's something to keep in mind since it can be used to scale any wall in the game that meets at a sharp angle like this, as long as the wall is not completely vertical. Once we reach the top, we can walk straight through the metal fence since it's only a one-sided wall, and proceed toward the secret side entrance to the castle's garden. Talon is sleeping here, preventing us from solving the block puzzle without hatching the weird egg, but we can skip both by using a bomb chew. First, stand on the highest step facing the castle wall, and pull out a bomb chew. Just as it's about to explode, Run off the ledge and spam the B button so that Link drops the bomb chew and begins a sword slash just as it explodes, knocking him vertically and forward just far enough to reach the ledge of the castle wall in a glitch known simply as a bomb chew jump. Needless to say, the timing of this is extremely precise, so if you don't get the trick after using one or two chews, you should probably reset to your last save to get the tin back. Bomb chews can't be found as drops from enemies or grass, and we can't buy more from shops without having the Goron Ruby. In other words, don't waste them. However, one nice fact about this glitch is that after you enter the crawl space to sneak into the castle, even if you get caught by the guards, the block puzzle will be automatically solved when you get thrown out. So no matter what happens, you only ever have to pull off the bomb chew jump once. After we make it past the guards and trigger the cutscene with Zelda, she asks if we have the Kokiri Emerald. No? No we don't. We cheated to escape the forest, and the Great Deku Tree is still being eaten out by Goma or whatever his problem is. What do you want me to lie? Uh, okay, I guess you do. After the cutscene ends, Zelda gives us her autograph, and Impa appears to teach us Zelda's lullaby. 
Better late than never, I guess. We could take Zelda's autograph to the guard in Kakariko in order to open the gate to Death Mountain, but considering that this is a glitch playthrough, I feel like I'm obligated to do everything as backwards as possible. So instead, let's go back to Kokiri Forest, enter Lost Woods, and then use the shortcut in the Lost Woods to skip straight to... No! God, please, no! We're trapped behind boulders by going this way, but this is where having early bomb chews come in. Our next goal is to authentically get the bomb bag so that we don't lose our sequence break when we use up these eight remaining bomb chew. We go straight to the top of Goron City and drop all the way down to the entrance to Dodongo's Cavern, which we crack open simple and easy with bomb chew number eight. We don't have the strength to pick bomb flowers without the Goron bracelet, and just navigating Dodongo's Cavern without that ability is going to consume a ton more bomb chew. I wasn't kidding when I said these things were going to go fast. We make our way through Dodongo's as usual, using little optimizations here and there, like an ISG to make quick work with Lizolfos, and using bomb chews to solve bomb flower puzzles. That is, until we cross the first rope bridge and reach the room with the sliding spike traps. In order to proceed further ahead, we have to solve the puzzle in this room, which involves shooting the eye switch with the slingshot in order to deactivate the fire on this platform. Problem is, the slingshot is still lying in a chest within the Deku tree. And believe me, I tried every method I could think of to reach the other side of this room without the slingshot, but every way came up short. There are all sorts of tricks we could do with more bomb chew, but with only two, this room is simply not possible to complete. But that doesn't mean we're stuck. If this room is such a problem, what if we just avoided using it in the first place? Our goal isn't to complete the dungeon after all, it's to get the bomb bag, which is lying in a chest in the previous room, just high up on a platform that's too high for us to climb from the ground, and too far for us to jump from the entrance. Except, what if I told you that as it turns out, this massive gap is absolutely possible to jump across, and that it will only cost a single bomb chew. Rather than jumping down into the room with the spike traps at all, stay at the top of the ladder and step as close to the left edge as possible without falling off. Now invert the camera so that Link's back is facing the faraway platform in question, and try to make Link's angle as parallel to the wall on his right as possible, while still leaving enough of an angle remaining to prevent getting trapped behind the wall. Finally, pull out a bomb chew, hold target, wait until it flashes red seven times, then press and hold R to shield drop it, mash the A button without touching the analog stick to perform a neutral roll forward, then the bomb chew should explode. Allow it to make contact with Link's shield for one frame exactly, then backflip, while still holding both target and R. Link should now backflip as the bomb chew explosion pushes him backward, and that additional momentum will be added to every frame of the backflip until he touches ground again, resulting in a massive backward jump known as a mega flip. Now that we've made it across the gap and onto the platform, skipping the need for the slingshot altogether, we can now climb up onto the platform ahead and open the chest for the bomb bag, replacing our need for bomb chews with a renewable, much more accessible source. Speedrunners jokingly call bombs in this game glitch ammo, and that assessment is absolutely true. The bomb bag is going to take this playthrough to new heights in terms of the magnitude of glitches we can perform. So make sure to save your game and make your way outside. We have everything we need from the cave. The next place we have to go is Sacred Forest Meadow to learn Saria Song. So we go back through the Goron City shortcut to reach the Lost Woods. We also catch some bugs in that empty bottle we got earlier and follow the path deeper to reach the meadow. The Sacred Forest Meadow is a maze full of Deku scrubs that you have to solve while locked to a top-down camera. And while a bit annoying, it doesn't generally take very long. But this is the perfect opportunity to teach you a new glitch and skip the maze in the process. Using the bombs we picked up into Dongo's Cavern, we now have the capability to trigger ISG anywhere and everywhere. Simply drop a bomb on the ground and press A to pick it up during a crouch stab. Picking up the bomb makes Link put his sword away so that you won't see a trail while running around, but if you see the trail during the animation of sheathing the sword, then you've gotten it. Now it's time to talk about the other property of ISG, the one that prevents Link from being able to jump or fall off ledges. By shield dropping two bombs at least one side hop with the part so that the explosion of one doesn't set off the other prematurely, we can backflip while holding R to block the explosion damage of the bombs, and ISG will keep Link floating in midair as if he were on the edge of a platform. The timing of this is fairly precise, and if you don't backflip and block the explosions of at least two bombs in rapid sequence like this, Link will automatically snap back to the floor. But you also have to do it against a wall so that Link doesn't backflip too far away from the bomb and his explosion radius can still reach his shield. If you manage to get Link hovering in the air after the first two bombs, he will no longer snap back to the floor automatically, and you can take your time with the next part. Now we can continue to climb further by shield dropping bombs in midair just before they explode, and backflipping while holding R to block the damage. 
ISG will be locking the camera, so it becomes impossible to see the bombs at this point, but here's an easy trick to make sure that you never miss the timing. No matter what horrible position the camera may be stuck in, you should always be able to see the game's HUD, and the hearts in the upper left corner always beat at a fixed rate. If you pull out a bomb when the beating heart is at its smallest, it will always blow up when it reaches its largest size for the fourth time. So time pressing the bomb button when the heart is at its smallest, count three full heartbeats, and then press and hold R to shield drop the bomb, backflipping at the same time to block its explosion just before the heart reaches its maximum size for the fourth time, knowing that that will be the moment the bomb explodes. It's a bit confusing to learn at first, but this method makes timing the glitch extremely consistent and allows you to be completely unreliant on an external timer or even seeing the bomb to perform it successfully. Continuing this loop, we can climb higher into the air infinitely as long as we have bombs, and eventually we will be on top of the walls of the maze, skipping it all together. Notably, this glitch is much easier to perform with bomb chews instead of bombs, which explode instantly when shield dropped in the air, meaning you don't have to time anything at all. And both are easier as an adult, where wearing the hover boots will lower Link's backflip distance and allow him to hover with any explosive, bombs or bomb chews, even in the open air when not against a wall something that is used extensively in randomizer runs to skip over large gaps and sequence break into late game areas much earlier than intended. Bomb hovering to skip the Sacred Forest Meadow Maze is hardly the most relevant use of the glitch, so how about I show a more interesting one? If you go to Lon Lon Ranch as an adult and bomb hover against the wall you are meant to jump with Epona in order to escape after being Ingo in a race, the game doesn't actually check to see if Link is currently on Epona, it just assumes that he must be in order to pass over the wall, and will play the cutscene of rescuing Epona as usual as well as unlock the ability for you to call her in Hyrule Field without ever racing Ingo. This is just one example of how bomb hovering can be used to break sequences and get little advantages here and there in almost any area in the game. If you are only interested in learning one Ocarina of Time glitch, you should learn this one. At this point, you might expect us to use bomb hovering to access Forest Temple as Young Link to collect the bow early, and while this is possible, we won't actually need the bow at all for this playthrough. In fact, we are here to learn Saria Song and nothing else. Once we have it, we head straight back out to the Lost Woods the way we came in and... Know your fucking place, trash! ...and take the shortcut to Goron City yet again. But we aren't here for Darunia. Instead, we climb up to the top of Death Mountain along the path with Falling Rocks. This route is meant to require the Hylian Shield to block the Falling Rocks, which we don't have, but hilariously, the rocks are programmed to spawn in front of the direction Link is facing, so that they land on his head when he walks forward. So if you target and simply walk backwards, you will never get hit. We then blow open the sealed Great Fairy Fountain with a bomb and play Zelda's lullaby inside in order to be given the ability to use magic by the Great Fairy. Back outside, the owl from earlier offers to fly us back to Kakariko Village, something that I will gladly accept. I can only imagine that he's trying to get on my good side because he knows that I'm ready to kill him. Now that we're back in the village, we need to perform one more glitch as young Link before becoming an adult, and this one requires a little bit of explaining. In Ocarina of Time, there are 10 items that serve no purpose beyond being shown to specific NPCs to trigger exclusive dialogues and be traded for the next item in the sequence until eventually resulting in acquiring the Big Goron Sword, which goes in the equipment screen along with Link's other swords. We won't be doing the trade quest in this playthrough, but some of these items are required to trigger specific glitches, and the first one we need is the Broken Goron Sword. This item can only be obtained from this guy called the Master Craftsman by giving him the Poacher Saw in exchange, an item we don't have. We could become an adult, collect the pocket egg, hatch it into the pocket cuckoo, show it to Talon to make it happy, then show it to the cuckoo lady to trade for Kojiro, show Kojiro to the Master Craftsman's son to trade for the odd mushroom, show the odd mushroom to the old woman in the potion shop for the odd potion, then finally show the odd potion to a Kokiri in the Lost Woods to obtain the Poacher Saw. Or... We could skip all of that and get it right now by cheating. I think I'm cheating. What's that, dear? I think I am cheating! While we're playing as Young Link, the Master Craftsman is here in Kakariko and easily accessible. So if we can somehow get the Broken Goron Sword from him now as a kid, it would allow us to skip ever having to get either Epona or the Longshot to cross the Broken Bridge in order to speak to him as an adult. Like I said earlier, these 10 items trigger exclusive dialogues with NPCs, and these dialogues are referred to internally as NPC events. An example of an NPC event would be when you play Saria Song to get dialogue with Saria which differs from what you would get from talking to her normally. We can abuse this mechanic to glitch the NPC event of the Master Craftsman, and it is for this reason that we needed Saria Song. First we talk to the Master Craftsman to exhaust his dialogue, then we need a chicken. 
we need to prime a Cuckoo so that it's one hit away from triggering the cutscene where they begin attacking Link. And this can be done in a multitude of ways, either with the sword or even with Deku Nuts. Next, take the Cuckoo to this corner, just before the stairs that lead up to Death Mountain Trail, and throw it at the corner. Finally, throw a bomb at the Cuckoo, and immediately begin back walking in a straight line toward the Master Craftsman. The moment the bomb goes off and deals the final point of damage to trigger the Cuckoo cutscene, you should also press A to talk to the Craftsman. His dialog box will open while the cutscene plays, and you should press A to close it here, when the camera pans up and is at its peak above the Cuckoo. Now the chickens will begin attacking Link, and you can pull out the ocarina and play Saria Song to be given the broken Goron sword straight away, with no poacher saw to give in exchange. The timing on this glitch is extremely precise, because it not only relies on pressing A to talk to the Master Craftsman just as the cutscene begins, but also on the Cuckoo being so far away that when the camera pans overhead the Cuckoo, the game unloads the Craftsman's model due to him being so far away. This is what makes the glitch function. When you close a dialog box, the game needs the model of the person you're talking to to be actively loaded in order to properly register that the conversation has ended. By pressing A to close the dialogue when the camera is so far away from the craftsman that his model has been unloaded due to distance, the game never registers that we ended the conversation with him. So then when we play Saria Song and trigger an NPC event, the game mistakenly triggers the master craftsman's NPC event since it thinks we are still currently in a dialogue with him. This is called the NPC event glitch, or also sometimes the text transfer glitch because it transfers the text from one character's dialogue into the event of another's. Of course, all that matters for us is that we now have the broken Goron Sword, meaning there is nothing stopping us from becoming an adult right away and beating Ganon. There is the small issue of not having a single spiritual stone or the Ocarina of Time or knowing the Song of Time, but those are just technicalities. We head straight to the Temple of Time from here, and we'll be getting the Master Sword right now. The problem is, there's a massive wall called the Door of Time separating us from the sword, and without all these aforementioned items, we can't open it. But if you take a look along the left or right side, there is a small gap that you can look through and see the subsequent room on the opposite side. Problem is, that gap is far too small for Link to fit through. Right? As you know, you can hop from side to side, backflip or roll forward when targeting by pressing the A button while holding a direction on the analog stick, but you actually have far more nuanced control over Link than just those four cardinal directions. If you hold slightly diagonal down left or down right so that Link's feet begin shifting back and forth like this, you can roll left or right by pressing A. And these rolls have their own unique angles that change the direction Link is facing if you release target during the rolling animation and then target again after. But that's not all. You can also side hop diagonally backward if you input a backflip at the right time just as one of these side rolls are ending. Both side rolling and the diagonally backward side hop you can perform immediately after one are required techniques for this next glitch, so I highly recommend practicing them in some open space first to get a feel for the timing. This glitch requires Link to be facing a very specific angle, so I'm going to show you a setup for it, and then once we have the angle, you cannot release the targeting button until we have made it to the opposite side of the door of time. To start, Put Link face to face with this wall at the entrance of the Temple of Time and target it so that the camera is parallel with the diagonal wall. Then perform a side roll by holding slightly diagonally down right and press A, releasing target and retargeting after the end of the animation. And finally do the same once more by side rolling to the left this time, also releasing target and retargeting after. If you did it right, you should be facing this angle, which is nearly straight ahead facing the left wall, but angled ever so slightly to the right. A good way to check is to look at the tiled floor. It needs to be nearly parallel with the black bar at the bottom of the screen, but slightly ramping up to the right. Once you have it, do not release target until the glitch is complete. Now we take Link all the way to the Dwarf Time and wedge him into the corner so that the gap we were looking through earlier is behind him and to the left. Now side roll to the left by holding slightly diagonally down left, press A to roll, and then input a backflip to turn that roll into a diagonal left side hop. This should be the proper angle to clip Link out of bounds, and if you press B, he will perform a jump slash to land back in bounds within the door of time and be ejected back out to the right. All of this still isn't enough to reach the opposite side of the door, but it's so close that if we continuously hold left after the backward side hop and through the jump slash, it will be. So once again, from the proper setup angle we got earlier, perform a side roll to the left by holding slightly diagonal down left and pressing A, then immediately switch to holding straight down and press A at the end of that rolling animation to turn that side roll into a diagonal left side hop, then at the moment that side hop begins, 
Switch to holding straight left and press B to begin a jump slash the moment Link pops out of bounds, continuing to hold left throughout its entirety. Put all that together in real time, and it should look like this. Not much more to say about this one. We just clipped through the door of time, and can now obtain the Master Sword without finishing a single dungeon. When we pull the sword, the long cutscene plays with Ganondorf telling us we suck, and the sage is time skipping us seven years into the future when Link is an adult. We then meet Sheik, who tells us to go to Kakariko Village. It's actually good advice for once. Glitch playthrough or not, Kakariko is exactly where we need to go next. Funny enough, because we never open the door of time properly, it's still there as an adult, and will spawn in when we get close to it, trapping us in the chamber with the Master Sword. Thankfully, it's a lot easier to get out than it was to get in. Simply pause the game, save it here, and reset your console or emulator to load back in at the entrance to the temple, granting us freedom once again, and allowing us to head straight for Kakariko. Normally, you would come here after becoming an adult to go to the Kakariko graveyard and find the hookshot. We won't need the hookshot at all for this playthrough, but we will need a shield to perform every glitch I have left to show off. Thankfully, if you pull open this specific gravesite with the flowers and drop down inside, there will be a small chest with a Hylian shield. Probably the most convenient way to pick one up in the entirety of the game, I'd say. With the shield in our possession, it's time to explain why we went to all the trouble of getting the broken Goron sword earlier. Reverse Bottle Adventure. These are your 3C buttons. Their internal memory addresses are 11A639, 11A63A, and 11A63B. Remember that in hexadecimal code, A follows 9 and B follows A. In other words, these values are all right next to each other in memory. The numbers stored in these addresses change when you equip an item to them and let the game know what link should do when you press one of the C buttons. This is pretty simple, except in the case of bottles. Because multiple bottles can be equipped at once, and all can have unique things inside them, there is another set of three addresses immediately to the right of these. Their job is to keep track of which slot in your inventory that C button item came from, and in the case of catching something in a bottle, then update that inventory slot by checking three addresses to the right. In other words, if you catch a fish in the second bottle in your inventory, the game will check three values to the right, and write the number corresponding to fish to that memory address so that it ends up in your second bottle and not in one of your others. As complicated as this is, there's still one memory address we haven't talked about yet, the B button. Its address is 11A63-8. It appears just before the first C button and is programmed like a C button in every way except from letting the player equip inventory items to it. But, knowing this fact, if we were to glitch a bottle onto the B button and catch something, the game would try to check three addresses over as usual to write the updated bottle into our inventory, but three addresses over from B is not an inventory slot address. It's C right. This means that by having certain items equipped to our C right button and catching certain things in bottles with B, we can combine these two values and create memory overflows that write whatever we want into our inventory, equipment, and quest status screens. In fact, there is no need to complete any dungeons at all in Ocarina of Time because you can simply write into the game's memory that you've done them all already. That's what the Broken Goron Sword is for, and why we caught bugs in our bottle while in the Lost Woods. The combination of bottled bugs on B and the Broken Goron Sword equipped on C right just so happens to correspond to a memory overflow that will write medallions directly into our inventory, which we need in order to get the light arrows, the only item that can defeat Ganondorf. So, what are we waiting for? Here's how to perform Reverse Bottle Adventure. First off, equip the bottled bugs we caught earlier on either C left or C down, and the Broken Goron Sword on C right. The moment we pull this off, the item ID of whatever is equipped on C right is going to direct where in the game's memory the item ID of bottled bugs will be written. As I said, the Broken Goron Sword directs the game to the location in memory where Link's medallions are registered, so it's a safe item but write a value in the wrong place, and we could permanently lose out on an important item like the ocarina, or bombs, or even the master sword, so make sure nothing else goes on C right. When playing as Adult Link, Reverse Bottle Adventure only works if started from a wall. I'll be doing it here at the side of these stairs to help us see a little more of what's going on, but you essentially just need something behind Link to prevent him from sliding backward. Turn Link 90 degrees in either direction and side hop. This will give us the proper spacing to begin the setup. Pull out a bomb, press R to shield drop it, 
perform a neutral roll forward to gain a small amount of forward movement, and then immediately backflip. This places the bomb the perfect spacing away from Link, and the wall the perfect spacing behind Link for the glitch to potentially trigger. Now we immediately drop bugs from our bottle, swing the bottle while empty to put it back in Link's left hand, hold R to raise the shield and block the explosion from the bomb, pressing B on this specific frame to have Link attempt to draw his sword, but be interrupted by the bomb's explosion radius. Finally, hold the C button with your bottle, move forward and release R without releasing C to recatch whatever you dropped, in our case bugs. In order to know where the game should put the newly bottled item, it checks what button was last pressed, which, since we are still holding down the C button with the bottle, will be B. That means the game mistakenly assumes we must have swung the bottle with B and places the bottled bugs on that button. This glitch is precise in a lot of different ways, but once you know the setup and get the spacing between Link, the bomb, and the wall consistently, the only hard part is timing the B press. You'll know you've gotten it when you see this weird twitch animation where the bottle on Link's left hand disappears before immediately reappearing. That is the animation of drawing the sword being interrupted by the bomb's explosion hitting Link's shield. If the bottle never disappears, it means your B press was too late. And if Link fully exchanges the bottle for his sword, then your B press was too early. All in all, when you perform all the steps of the glitch properly in sequence, it will look like this. And while I probably would consider this the hardest glitch showcased in this video, it is by no means the hardest glitch in Ocarina of Time. You can absolutely learn it, even as a beginner. Now, if we pause the game and open the quest status screen, you'll see that the item ID of bugs being written to the medallion location in memory has caused us to obtain the forest, water, spirit, and shadow medallions, while deleting the light medallion that we had moments before. This is a permanent change, by the way. So at this point, you may be asking yourself how exactly we're going to get the light arrows if our light medallion was just permanently deleted. But here's a fun fact about Ocarina of Time. The light medallion is completely useless. The game is lazy, and when it comes to checking if you've completed all the adult dungeons, it actually only bothers to check if you have the medallions from the last two. Since we have Shadow and Spirit now, that's all that matters. We're done. Now if we return to the Temple of Time, Zelda would be waiting there for us, triggering a cutscene where she talks about how she's happy that she trusted us with the Ocarina of Time seven years ago. I mean, you literally never did, and because of that I had to learn how to backflip through a door, but I mean, that's it's whatever, it's fine. More importantly, she also gives us the Light Arrows, the last item we were missing before challenging Ganondorf. So now you might be thinking, Phobia, how exactly do you plan to shoot the Light Arrows when you never got the bow? Funny thing about that, if you try to equip an elemental arrow on C without a bow, the game just generates one in Link's hand anyway. We don't actually need a bow to shoot the light arrows, but we do need arrows. Because we never got the bow from Forest Temple, we also never got a quiver, and that is a much bigger deal than it first seems. Without a quiver being registered to our inventory, we can't get arrows as drops, and shops won't sell them to us either. No matter what, we cannot defeat Ganondorf without registering that we've gotten a quiver. Luckily for us, the bottle from earlier is still on B, so we can use Reverse Bottle Adventure a second time to write into the game's memory that we have a quiver. This time, the combination of items that we need is a bottled fish on B and Kojiro the Blue Cucko on C right. If you go to the right after leaving Hyrule Castle, you'll find a grotto where you can catch a fish, and make sure to keep Broken Goron Sword equipped on C right as you do. Remember, as long as there's a bottle on B, RBA is active, and you will be writing arbitrary and potentially dangerous values into memory every time you press the B button, including when we catch this fish. Now to get Kojiro, we return to Kakariko Village one final time and talk to the Kako Lady to begin the trade quest as usual, getting the first item, the pocket egg. With this in our inventory, we wait one day-night cycle for the egg to hatch into the pocket Kako, then go inside this building in Kakariko and use it to wake up Talon, which makes it happy, apparently. Now we can return the happy pocket cuckoo to the lady who gave us the egg to receive Kojiro in exchange. If we open our equipment screen right now, you'll see that in our ammo slot above the bomb bag we have... Uh... Hover boots? Right, so this is a graphical error that happens if you become an adult before getting the slingshot from Deku Tree, but we don't actually have the hover boots. The game is just trying and failing to show that we have nothing in our ammo slot. But if we equip Kojiro on C right, press B to drop the fish we caught earlier, and press B again to re-catch it, this immediately writes the aforementioned quiver into our inventory, meaning arrows will now appear as drops 
and shops will finally sell arrows to us. With some ammunition finally at our disposal, we try the light arrows once again, and... It's time to finally, actually, go to Ganon's castle. We're officially done using Reverse Bottle Adventure at this point, so to deactivate the glitch and get a usable sword back on the B button, simply pause the game, go to the equipment screen, and press A on the highlighted Master Sword to re-equip it. Now it will reappear on the B button as usual, and your C buttons are free to use however you like without risking writing something in a dangerous location. If you ever want to reactivate RBA for any reason, you'll need to perform the full setup once again as before. Approaching Ganon's castle will trigger the cutscene of the six sages creating the Rainbow Bridge, allowing us to reach the entrance. The trigger for which, once again, is only obtaining the last two medallions rather than all six like the game claims. Once inside, we are immediately faced with a magic barrier, preventing us from accessing the inner part of the castle, and by extension, Ganondorf's boss room. In order to remove it, we must complete the six trials, many dungeons based on the theme of each of the six medallions. The problem is, these trials assume that we have played through all of the earlier dungeons in the game as well, and often require the items from them in order to be completed. Fire arrows, hover boots, long shot, we're missing so many key items, completing the six trials as intended isn't even close to possible. But, let's be honest, did you really expect that we would at this point? If I turn on a collision viewer, we can see the design of this room in more detail. The light green represents the ground floor, the white represents walls and platforms, and the dark green represents a loading zone. In this case, you can see the loading zone for the inner castle on the opposite side of the magic barrier, just outside of a reach. But if we take the stairs down to the right, you'll also see that the entire right side of the centermost column is also marked as dark green. This is a mistake that was made during Ocarina of Time's development. The wall directly in front of the door to the water trial was accidentally marked as both a wall and a loading zone in all versions of the game. But it's not like it really matters because you can't walk through a wall anyway, right? Well, not in a normal playthrough, you can't. Link can walk face first into this wall all day and nothing will happen, but if we use the bomb hovering technique we learned in Sacred Forest Meadow to float up into the air with enough height, a backflip can trigger this loading zone flag within the wall, passing us directly through the wall and straight into the inner castle that leads to Ganondorf. This wall accidentally being flagged as a loading zone was never corrected in any version of Ocarina because it wasn't thought to have been exploitable, that is, until bomb hovering was discovered years later. We make our way all the way to the top of the stairs to trigger the cutscene with Ganondorf and begin the boss fight. First, we have to reflect the magic he throws at us back with well-timed sword swings, or in this case, an empty bottle. This is a pretty well-known trick at this point, but I thought I'd show it off just for that one person watching the video that might not have known this was possible. Once we get an opportunity to strike, we fire off a light arrow, paralyzing Ganondorf and pinning him to the ground to be hit by the Master Sword. In short order, he's defeated and begins bringing down the castle, forcing us to escape to the ground floor alongside Zelda. As usual, he is not yet defeated, and uses the Triforce of Power to transform fully into Ganon. This wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the fact that during the cutscene, he knocks the Master Sword out of Link's hand, forcing us to complete the first phase of the fight with some other weapon. You're meant to use the Megaton Hammer or Biguron Sword for this, but we have neither of those. In fact, the only other damage dealing item we have on hand are bombs, which goes about like you'd expect, with us taking as much damage as he does. While it might be technically possible to beat Ganon with bombs, here's a much easier way. Rather than rush forward to trigger the boss fight immediately, if we instead walk behind Zelda, we can perform a glitch known as a super slide by pulling out a bomb, holding R to shield drop it, back flipping, and waiting a brief moment before spamming the A button to perform two neutral rolls forward and attempt to pick up the bomb just as it explodes. The explosion will push Link backwards while he is stuck in the lifting animation, meaning the pushback gets repeated indefinitely for as long as you're holding R. This glitch allows us to enter the trigger for the final cutscene with our shield raised, and as long as we continue to hold R during the cutscene, we can block Ganon when he attempts to knock the Master Sword out of our hand. Even though we see it go flying and land near Zelda, if we pause the game, yep, the Master Sword is still in our inventory, meaning we can still use it to deal damage to the boss. When the second cutscene plays and Zelda calls to us to come pick up the Master Sword, we do have to go collect it in order to proceed to the final phase of the fight, which is interesting because we get to see the duplicated copy of the sword fuse back into the one that's still in our hand. After a few more hits, Ganon is defeated, Zelda calls on the six sages to seal him within the sacred realm, 
and we rightfully take our place as Hero of Time without a single dungeon completed. With the threat to Hyrule removed, Link returns the Master Sword to the pedestal in the Temple of Time, becoming a kid again, and can finally live out his childhood in peace. Right? Ha 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 ha!